MSI motherboards have been competent the last few generations. Sure, let's go for that for an intro. So let's see how well the MSI X870 Gaming Plus Wi-Fi bodes then, seeing how that will cost you $270, which makes it one of the more expensive X870 boards. So let's see what they've done to actually justify that price. And starting off, looking at just the CPU power delivery configuration, we do have 14 plus 2 plus 1 power phases here rated at just 60 amps, which is definitely on the lower end of the VRM configs we've seen this generation, especially at this kind of price point. But again, it really does not matter to pretty much anyone unless you're hardcore into overclocking, especially when combined with two full 8 pins for CPU power. And MSI was still able to raid this thing at up to 8200 mega transfers per second when it comes to memory overclocking. You do have the expected primary PC Gen 5 slot. Then below that, two physical 16x but actually just 1x Gen 3 slots. And then below that, one more physical 16x slot that runs four Gen 4 lanes. Which again, at that point, how hard is it just to give us a physical 1x slot so that smaller cards look better in it. At this point, forget about the rhinos and the pandas or whatever. The 1x slot is what's truly critically endangered and needs to be saved here. Now, when it comes to storage, you do just get three M.2 slots here, with one of them being Gen 5 and other two being Gen 4, which while many other boards at this price do have four, it's important to remember that PCIe lanes are a bit of a scarce resource on X870, so most of the time you aren't able to use all the slots anyway without sacrificing some other element of your motherboard. So I can't complain too much about that. However, the Gaming Plus isn't free from this kind of issues either. Seeing how that last PC Gen 4 slot will actually get disabled if you install an NVMe in that final M.2 slot. And rounding up the storage options, we do have four SATA connectors, which again, I wish that was six, especially at this kind of price point, but I do understand that, especially for many new PC builders, SATA hard drives and SSDs are already up there with floppy drives when it comes to how often they're used in builds. And in terms of the other internal I.O., we do thankfully have the full eight various fan connectors, as is to be expected of a board of this caliber, <clears throat> looking at you, Gigabyte, and also the expected free addressable and one plain old-fashioned non-addressable RGB connector. If we do a quick sit rep, there isn't too much of a reason to spend more on this board from MSI right now, unless you really need all those PCIe slots, but maybe the rear I.O. is what changes it, and it does have a pretty nice eight USB Type-A ports, with half of them being Gen 2. However, for some reason, well, you do get two USB Type-C connectors, while one of them is full speed 40 gigabit per second, the other is only 20 gigs, which is just bizarre. Seeing how you can get motherboards that are way cheaper than this, they have two full 40 gig ports. So I have no idea how MSI are able to justify that. However, we do have some form of compensation with the fact you do get 5 gig networking, which is a bit overkill for most people. And let's be honest, most users would prefer to have faster USB, which you'll actually use rather than 5 gigabit LAN, which will only really come in useful if you have some fast local NAS or whatever, or you live in Switzerland where fast internet flows like water. Apart from that, you also have HDMI for integrated graphics, however, no display port, the expected Wi Fi 7, and unfortunately, just free audio jacks and no optical spit if. Are you kidding me, MSI? And it's all running out of the aging ALC A97 codec. Meaning that overall, while there are some pretty nice things about the MSI Gaming Plus Wi Fi, if you really don't care about uh, 5 gigabit networking or all of the additional PCIe slots, or the way it looks, and I gotta admit, it does look pretty nice. However, just like MSI's Tomahawk, this one also doesn't have any RGB. I think many people will find it hard to justify that price to themselves, and the issue is that all of those engineers working for Lucky the Dragon have failed to do a lot to really make this thing stand out for the price. Again, don't get me wrong, it is still a great overall motherboard, but there's just a couple of those other things that really annoy me, like the fact that you don't have those two full 40 gigabit per second USB Type-C ports at the back. Like, why? But still, it is a fine of a board. If you want to get it yourself, then Amazon and Newark links to it will be up in the icons and down in the video description below. And maybe check out our Patreon as well, because all Ultra Tier patrons in December will be getting a special one of a kind Christmas card from moi. Plus, huge thanks to Gavin Burns, Justin Rage, I love Ronyak, Vardash Foka, Patrick Harrison, not a pseudonym, Mech, Summon the Sheet, Allcroft, and Level Up. But anyway, that's about it, so I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then remember to subscribe, like whatever, and I'll see you all in whatever I make next. Goodbye, everyone. Cute. Bye.